Today we are joined with Tony Fraser. He is uh, uh, the editor of Sherman's book, and he's also a translator of German and Spanish contemporary uh, poetry. Welcome to the Cervantes Institute. Thank you very much indeed. You have studied quite well the Anglo-American, German and Hispanic poetic tradition. What element, if any, stands out of any of the, each tradition? I wouldn't say that I know the total traditions of each of those particularly well. But I would say that uh, in contemporary, I, the contemporary writing since, say, 1920, it's very interesting to follow the trajectory of the, the three areas. Uh, and they're very, very different. Um, and one of the reasons that I read poetry in another language is to find things that my own language cannot give me. So um, since 1920, for instance, since T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound at the beginning of the 20th century, um, the, the, the trajectory of modernism uh, in, in English is very, very different from what happened in, in Spain and in Latin America, or indeed in Germany. And uh, I read Paul Celan, for instance, in German, because no English or English language poet writes like that. Uh, and I read somebody like uh, Cesar Vallejo in Spanish for exactly the same reason. Uh, and it's also interesting, for instance, that the impact of surrealism in Spanish writing is very marked uh, and gives rise to somebody like Octavio Paz, who is extremely important. Um, but nobody writes like Octavio Paz in English. Uh, and surrealism had no impact at all in England or in the United States. So it's different things are available in those literatures. You are a vast reader of poetry all over, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you are also a translator. How can you manage? How, how, which are the elements that make you to choose a book to translate? It's simply that which strikes you as most interesting. Um, and it is? Well, you never know until you see it. Uh, and sometimes there's an accident. Uh, there was, I will not mention the name, but there was a German poet whom I didn't like at all. Uh, and something was sent to me uh, in translation, and I thought the translation was fantastic. And I thought, hang on, I've read the original, I didn't like this. And then I sat down again with the translation and the original and discovered that I was reading it badly. It was my fault. And the translation that this person brought to me, of this particular German poet, showed me things that I had never seen before. Talking about translator, translations, you are, you are yourself a translator, mm -hmm. and you know that translators had been sometimes uh, glorified, oh, a translator is a creative man mm -hmm. or woman, and others is like, oh, a translator is only a, a worker who just uh, is not really such a big job. How do you define a translator? Um, well, the translator should be a mix of the two. I mean, first of all, you have to be at the service of the original text, which means your scope for creativity has to be lessened to some extent. On the other hand, you're bringing your skills in your home language to bear in a way that hopefully only a real writer in that language can, can bring. That's what I think, but you know, there are so many opinions on this subject. Um, I don't believe in word-for-word -word faithful translation unless it's in a translation class and you're studying the language. Have you ever uh, come across a translation that uh, you have thought that is better than the original? No. <laughs> There is a famous story that uh, Baudelaire's translation of Edgar Allan Poe is better than the original, but frankly, I can't really judge. My French isn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of poetry uh, do you publish in Sherman's book? It's quite a wide spectrum, um, but I think in terms of the, the stuff written in English, uh, we tend towards a slightly more experimental kind of writing than the mainstream. Um, that's because, in some ways, that's what I like to read. And secondly, it's because uh, the mainstream or more normal kind of writing is taken care of very, very well by other publishers. Uh, and I think I'm very well read in the other area, and I can bring something to the book market that is not uh, otherwise taken care of. How do you come across and how do you start to, la to this love that you have for the Spanish uh, poetry writers? <laughs> Well, it's one of those things. Many, many years ago, um, when I was working full-time uh, in the financial industry, I was sent to work in Latin America, uh, but I didn't speak Spanish. And so I had to learn Spanish very quickly uh, and arrived in Chile. And the first thing I did was to go to a bookshop. And the first thing I did was to buy a book of poetry and started trying to read it. And that was by a, a writer I still value called Cecilia Vicuña. 
she's a performance artist now in New York. Um, but that was the beginning of a love affair with particularly Latin American poetry. And that's where I discovered Vicente Vidobro, for instance, and, and uh, Pablo de Roca, among the other Chilean writers, Raul Zurita. Uh, and then it was just a question of rolling on from there, finding out other things. I knew nothing. I, I bought books, bought an anthology, who's next on the list? So I start to read Peruvian writers or I start to read Uruguayan writers. And later I lived in Mexico, so I read Mexican writers. So little by little. You yeah. have mentioned something that uh, I'm sure it's a, co it's a combination of very weird for so many. A businessman who likes poetry. <laughs> have you come across so many businessmen who read poetry? Funnily enough, yes, I have. Yeah. Um, uh, I did spend some of my life working in the Far East, uh, in Macau, which at the time was a, a Portuguese dependency. And uh, the chief of one of the insurance companies there was a very fine experimental poet. <laughs> I even translated some of his work. <laughs> and uh, Tony, I would like to know uh, the canon of literature. Who mm. decides nowadays? We know that someone is there who tells us what to read, how to read it, and if we should like it or not. Uh, who are th those men now, how, or women, and how can we fight against that? I think as soon as somebody tells you what to read, you should start to fight. Um, the idea of a canon is to some extent necessary, but the canon must always be changing. Uh, and it's inevitable. Tastes will change. Um, uh, you, it's obvious that uh, a number of women writers have been recovered who previously were ignored, and that's very important. And so I think we begin to add those names to our histories. Uh, likewise, tastes change dramatically. To take an Eng English example, uh, thanks to T.S. Eliot, people started to read John Donne again. And we now regard John Donne as one of the greatest poets in the English language. Before 1920, very, very few people read John Donne uh, because he was regarded as just weird. And outside of the, the tradition, as academics had drawn that tradition, and that takes us to another point. A, ca a canon formation is often an academic process. And I believe there is an unfortunate tendency for academics to think in terms of tram lines. I, everything goes along a nice straight line from here to there. And there's no deviation on either side. And in fact, the real history of literature or art is like that to get to that point. Um, and so you have to look at all other areas. And they tend also not to like or be interested in poets or writers or artists who stand alone, who do not have heirs, who do not have followers. And I think that's bad. And if we, if we um, followed that particular line of thinking, then somebody like Paul Silan, whom I've already mentioned in Germany, may be one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. He has no followers. But he might be the greatest poet in the German language of the last 100 years. Tony, you have been many years in this editorial world, and uh, do you have any dream to fulfill? Um, I have two, I suppose. I want to keep publishing what I consider to be important and useful books, and that's a very simple one. I think I'll be able to do that. The second is one from when I stopped publishing. I want to translate um, at least most of the poetry of Nelly Zacks, who's a German poet who won the Nobel Prize in the late 60s. So with these two dreams, hoping that uh, you will fill them, thank you very much for coming. It's my pleasure. Thank you.